Hi there, and welcome to Finding Space for Stories, Crafting Meaningful Narratives for Mechanics-Led Games. So, what do I mean when I say mechanics-led <laughs> games? This slide shows a scale with examples of what I'd call narrative-led games on the left and mechanics-led games on the right. You can see that the narrative-led oh, you can see that the narrative-led category trends towards games with simpler core loops, while the mechanics-led titles are entirely built around gameplay. The term mechanics-led covers quite a lot of territory, and of course, just because they're mechanics-led doesn't mean that they have poorly crafted narratives. Rage 2 has motion-captured cinematics and hours of voiceover, but it was marketed on over-the-top traversal and combat. Games like Tetris and Mario Kart don't even have stories, so they're very good examples of what I mean when I say mechanics-led games. So what lessons have I learned from creating narratives for mechanics-led games? While it's a well-established aspect of interactive media, authored storytelling can be seen as a luxury by some game development teams. This can lead to narrative becoming something to eventually get around to, which typically results in narrative specialists joining the team quite late. This in turn leads to floating assumptions about what, what the narrative will be, which can lead to fundamental narrative decisions being made in the absence of any narrative design at all. One term that has become especially egregious to me, if there's any other narrative designers in the room, they might flinch at this, is the term narrative wrapper. I understand that a game is built around a core of fun gameplay with narrative added on top, but wrapper, the word wrapper suggests something disposable that contains the game that you want to play. If you are a narrative designer who joins the project after this mindset has taken hold, it can add extra challenges. For me, it manifested as concern that I was only there to tick a box so we have a narrative and not really make any meaningful contribution other than that. No one wants to make filler. One way of countering this mindset is the establishment of narrative champions within your project. These people represent the interests of a project's narrative in meetings as well as in the informal spaces like lunch chats, after work, after work drinks or five-a-side football games. While your project's narrative specialist should always be a champion for a game's narrative, there's no need for them to do this on their own. These lessons can be useful to anyone who considers themselves a narrative champion or values narrative within their games. The earlier you bring specialists into a game's development, the more scope and quality they can bring to their corner of the project. When your team doesn't have a narrative specialist, this is when narrative champions really need to hold the fort and advocate for narrative choices until your narrative specialist shows up to really represent the, represent the project's narrative. Even once the narrative specialist has joined, that doesn't mean that your narrative champions retire. After all, your narrative designers and writers can't make it to every single meeting, and I can tell you from personal experience that most of us dislike five-a-side football. <laughs> Getting your narrative designers and writers involved in the process from early on in a project will allow them to create a narrative that grows alongside the mechanics instead of feeling tacked on or applied like a wrapper. Interdisciplinary dynamics will benefit from a team that starts off together and grows together into the project. This gives everyone a sense of equality and greater ownership over their own work instead of inheriting a responsibility that's been assigned to you. In contrast, if your narrative specialist is brought into a project once its foundation has already been established, you will have some of the challenges that I've alluded to previously. Instead of being a part of the established workflow where people are used to you taking up the space, you can feel like an interloper or a meddler whose presence makes, works tougher, whose presence makes work tougher for those around you. From my own experience, I can tell you that even the most reasonable requests can start to feel like excessive demands when you join a project late. As much as your colleagues knew that they were going to have a narrative designer eventually asking them to do things, remember that the difference between a hypothetical narrative and the one that you as a narrative designer actually want to make is quite a big one. And you can feel hemmed in by the assumptions that have been made by other people before you even join the project. As any experienced developer knows, cooperation is key to any project. When you're telling stories in an environment where the game's focus is already established as mechanics-led, you are going to need allies to help you create the narrative experiences that you want to deliver. 
The dismissively labeled soft skills in your arsenal become incredibly important. For anyone who's just getting their start in the industry, don't dismiss soft skills, please. <laughs> uh, it's not that your teammates necessarily disagree with your proposals, but your idea could mean sacrificing another feature. It's not exclusive to narrative by any means, but leave your ego at the door. Being a team player unlocks doors that you might otherwise be tempted to batter through instead. If you've made good alliances within your team, and the next time you've got an ambitious idea to pitch to your producer or to the wider team, people will be more receptive to what you have to say. If there are other members of your team who have an interest or a passion for narrative design, do not hesitate to use them as a sounding board and let them in on your plans. Blue sky thinking is great, but even the best concepts need to be reined in by constraints. Conversely, you can stifle your own ambitions due to a lack of confidence or a fear that you'll be seen as being demanding or naive about what you can actually ask for. I've been guilty of self-sabotaging based on assumptions that a project wasn't going to allow me to do things. If you can gauge the expected quality level ahead of time, use this information to establish a standard that you are personally happy with. It will be your benchmark when discussing standards with the wider team. It's good to be ambitious and respectfully question assumptions about where your narrative is constrained. But remember that if a game is selling itself on its mechanics, you need to pick your battles wisely. On my first project as a solo narrative designer, I joined with just a few months left before I had to be finished with the work. I was to create a standalone story for a well-established mechanics-led game. The setting and gameplay had already been established and I was given complete control over the characters, the story, the missions. I felt totally in over my head, having been given all the freedom to tell a story, but none of the tools to actually make it happen. I started by going with the grain and letting the pre-established mechanics lead my story somewhere. The game was an open world experience where players could explore a beautiful environment filled with wildlife and a few bespoke landmarks that existed without context at this point. I immediately picked these landmarks as mission locations. After all, if it's where the art and game design team are focusing their efforts, doesn't it make sense that that's going to be the nicest parts of your game? This was my first experience of pushing a symbiotic dynamic where I could incentivize players to visit these beauty spots that had been so lovingly created long before I joined the team. In return, my stories had dramatic and unique backdrops where I could deliver impactful story beats. Once again, this isn't exclusive to narrative, but the biggest lesson I learned as a latecomer solo narrative designer to a project was to get my requests into art and audio as early as possible. They will really appreciate it. So will your producer. Whether it's a bespoke tire track texture that you need to lay evidence in a conspiracy or the sounds of gunfire in the distance to raise tension, you'll have dependencies that can make or break your story. Going with the grain is great, but eventually you will need something specific that must be custom made. I've spoken so much about integrating and cooperating with your fellow devs, but what about the most important people, the players? When you join a team to make DLC for an already successful title, it can be a little intimidating at first. The insecurities you may feel working in a team that's focused on a mechanics-led project, it makes sense that you would extrapolate that out into feeling like your players are probably gonna feel the same way. Some player research actually came to light on one of my projects, telling us that players didn't like having the core gameplay, uh, core gameplay mechanics in the missions as they'd prefer to enjoy the game their way and not be constrained by what some designer tells them to do. This defined a line between what the game is designed to deliver and the story that we tell in our game. As much as I hated it when it was considered a narrative wrapper, the need to detach narrative from the entire reason people came to play the game became a much greater challenge. My main learning from this experience was that it's not a good idea for your narrative to steer players away from what they love about the game. It was better to make a story for the players who choose it, and it doesn't encroach on the experience of those who just want to do their own thing. I saw that if players were given a break in the story every now and then, they would take it and eventually find their way back whenever they were ready for the next chapter. This no pressure approach to storytelling hopefully minimized the frustration of players who just wanted to go and shoot things and didn't really care about completing objectives. I'm sure there's some of us in here. 
Even if the challenges involved in making narratives for mechanics-led games are a lot to deal with, the good news is that it is always worth the effort. My main takeaway from working on these DLCs was this. Even if only a fraction of the players will see your story through to the end, you need to make the best story you can for them. These people exist, and a well-told story is an essential part of the experience for them. Numbers don't show the whole picture, even if they're in the minority. The players who are passionate about your contribution will remind you that your work is someone's favourite part of the games that you make. Thank you for listening. <laughs>